Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to 2024. And I, on behalf of the Signal 360 team, I want to wish you all a very productive, healthy, and very happy new year. And uh, welcome, John. Happy new year to you as well. Good to see happy you. Happy new year, Stan. Hi, everybody out there. Well, I hope you had a very relaxing and somewhat productive uh, break as well, because you've been hard at work, like reflecting on the years, the year past and looking forward. And that's what we want to talk about uh, today. Um, for now, 21 years, which is quite a history, you uh, produce 10 annual predictions on marketing technology and media. And you did the same for 2024. But before we dive into 2024 and have a discussion, and we unfortunately we can't cover all 10 of them, but we'll, we'll, we'll take a hack out of it. Let's reflect on 2023 um, because it was an interesting and somewhat unpredictable year, I believe, John. Um, any insights that you want to share with the audience where you reflect back on 2023? Yeah, um, well, I learned a few things. Um, if I should probably stick to technology um, and marketing and stay away from anything involving, um, well, I guess Elon Musk might be the way of putting it, but, but really uh, my batting average went down in 23 because uh, I tried to predict what was happening with Twitter and I had an optimistic take, which is by the end of the year, it would be turned around and that didn't happen. Um, but when it came to AI, uh, I think what I imagined was going to happen actually did. Uh, and I had many predictions on AI, uh, most of which had to do with the way the business would play out. Um, as those out there might recall, a year ago, everyone was freaking out about AI's impact on search um, and how the big players, particularly Google, would respond. Um, and one of my predictions was that Google would integrate uh, its own AI chatbot, uh, generative AI service into uh, its main search service, but it would do vote so very, very cautiously, uh, which is exactly what played out. Um, and that OpenAI would find a business model um, and start to make some serious money, which also played out. As a matter of fact, when I wrote my uh, predictions review a few weeks ago, um, the numbers that were being bandied about was that OpenAI was already past a billion dollars in annualized revenue. Uh, just this week, that number has been um, updated to $1.6 billion in annualized wow. revenue. So my prediction that AI was going to get a business model seems like it has certainly started to play out. Well, that's great. I think that's the key takeaway from 2023. To AI is here, right? And and hopefully it's here to stay in some ways. We'll get back to that uh, that shortly. And oh boy, we had a lot of drama attached to open AI as well, not just Elon Musk. So, uh, and other things like, yeah, stay away from the drama side of the business. I, I That might be the recommendation on that one. Um, you titled your predictions for 2024. It's all about the data. Can you explain that? Yeah, you know, when I looked after, in, uh, if, if folks out there have read uh, my predictions, one of the things I do consistently year on year is I don't think too hard about it. Um, I found that I do better if I don't overthink it. So I just sit down and write. Um, and, you know, a few hours later, I look up and reread what I've written. And I found a theme running through almost every one of the things that I've, you know, noted in my 2024 predictions. And that's essentially the way that our society is grappling with this new uh, asset, which, uh, you know, broadly speaking, we can tag as data. But what we're really trying to figure out is who owns it, who controls it, who governs it, what are the rules, um, who gets the value from it. Um, and AI, of course, has thrown all of this into some very sharp relief. Um, for example, if you look at the recent lawsuits by the New York Times, uh, last week uh, and many others uh, in the months prior, it was like, wait a minute, do you have the right to use my data, my information to train your new models where you're going to be banking money in a market that I'm already in business in? Um, uh, another question is, hey, shouldn't I have the right to all the data that I co-create on social media platforms? I should be able to take that data and do other things with it. 
Um, and that is related to one of the uh, predictions I made about how social media networks are going to evolve this year. And, and lastly, if we're going to uh, make a lot of value out of these new tools, um, we're going to need as enterprises, as large organizations, we're going to need to be able to tap into, govern, uh, manage uh, the data that we have as assets that, you know, many large corporations have put billions of dollars into uh, creating over the past couple of decades as the digital revolution really took hold. Um, those data assets are very difficult to unlock because of the way that companies govern them. And uh, in many cases, those companies are also in regulatory frameworks, whether it's financial services, uh, CPG, lots of uh, you know, regulatory uh, rules around how data might be used. So all of that has to be untangled before you can just throw AI at it and make it all better. Well, thanks. And that sets up the conversation nicely across all the predictions. And indeed, that is a nice red line through, through all of it. Let's start with AI, which appeared last year. Actually, it was on the horizon for a while, but in public uh, in the past year really became something to behold, right? Uh, everybody can access chat GPT. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, AI win art contests unbeknowingly to the judges. Um, we see the first AI generated commercials come out. Um, we have seen that, uh, AI makes for good writers for sports illustrated. Um, so all kinds of stories around that. Will this, um, will this, uh, story continue the way it has in the past year? What do you see on the horizon? Is this just a steep upward slope here? I don't think so. Um, my first prediction is that the AI party is going to take a pause. That doesn't mean that there won't be sort of a domination of the headlines by AI related topics, but rather uh, taken as a whole, we have a lot of, I guess you could call it, you know, digesting to do. Um, and this is typical of, uh, you know, of large uh, narratives that play out across technology over time is that, you know, once uh, the general public gets a taste of what might be coming. Everyone gets very excited. And once business realizes what might be possible, they start to invest. Um, and then what happens almost always is, oh gosh, this is going to be harder than I thought. Or uh, the aforementioned, you know, this is going to be very difficult to, to, to figure out how to integrate this new technology into a, you know, two or three decade old IT stack. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, of, of, of integration and, and, and digesting that needs to happen. Add to that the complication of, of the uncertainty of the regulatory frameworks of pending uh, lawsuits, uh, of, you know, the conservative nature of corporations in terms of not wanting to go too far down a road that might get cut off by new regulations. Um, and of course, a decade now or more where we, you know, the entire business community has been a little bit burned by um, getting too far over our skis when it comes to investing in new technologies generally, whether that's a Web3 and crypto, which was, of course, the craze in 2021 to 22, um, or whether it's, you know, over rotating on investment in social media platforms for marketing and, and go to market activities and then realizing that there were downsides to that. So I think that caution um, and a little bit of chin stroking will probably uh, be a big part of 2024, even as we continue to see extraordinary and important work being done to build out the capabilities uh, of this AI ecosystem. So what um, what do you see on the near horizon as actual tangible applications of AI that might be commonplace in the next two or three years? So one of the most exciting areas, uh, and I like to, I've been writing about this for some time, is, is what I call the genie. Um, like literally the, you know, like Aladdin's genie that comes out of a lamp and grants you wishes. Um, the idea that we might, uh, that consumers might have um, these genies, which are essentially AI chatbots that are very specifically tuned 
to do tasks that are otherwise very difficult or time consuming or frustrating are all three things. For example, filing health claims um, or um, trying to book a you know, complicated travel itinerary and ensure that you're getting the best deal. Um, these are information driven um, tasks that require touching a lot of what are called digital surfaces, your data, uh, travel sites, um, you know, Google flights, things like that. Um, these are perfect opportunities for entrepreneurs to create new kinds of services um, that are tuned to do one thing really, really well. Um, I would expect to see a lot of these uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. And I would expect companies in particular uh, and marketers specifically to start leveraging these kinds of tools as customer service capabilities that can be marketed uh, and help with go-to-market activities. That sounds to me like a great opportunity for technology to be truly useful, right? So that's right. So one of the uh, areas that I look at then is the incumbents, the large tech companies who have a lot of wherewithal because um, AI is fairly capital intensive. It requires lots of computing power. It like, requires lots of experts to build it, right? So I would see, and you know, somewhat proven out the last year, a, a, a really nice return for uh, big tech here. Now you have a bit of a contrary, uh, contradictory opinion of what might happen with big tech in the, the year ahead. And uh, I have to say, it's like you were a few days ahead of a downgrade by Barclays of Apple, uh, which you thank you for sending that. Um, that uh, so what's ahead for big tech in this? I thought it was all, all clear sunshine and the next uh, trillion dollars to be added. And sorry for my cat in the background. Um, the, uh, the next uh, trillion dollars to be added was, would be this year for Apple, for example. Well, in, in, you're right. In my, in my predictions, I called it big tech's midlife crisis. Um, and, you know, we've seen, you know, midlife crisis, I can attest, can last for quite a number of years. Um, so I think, I think we're already in it for big tech. But even as big tech is starting to, you know, uh, to age um, and uh, it's getting so big that it's very hard to continue to grow that the way that everyone expects it to grow on Wall Street. Um, in order to grow that way, big tech has to start doing things that essentially um, aren't necessarily good for their customers. Uh, for example, if you are an Amazon Prime user, you probably got an email last week uh, telling you that, oh, by the way, we're going to be adding ads to your Amazon Prime experience. Now, of course, Stan, you and I are big fans of advertising. Um, but as a signal 360, uh, but changing the goalposts, moving them uh, in this way is going to make customers angry. And if this death by a thousand cuts occurs 10, 15, 20 times a month across four or five large big tech platforms, it starts to make consumers interested in alternatives. And I think we'll see that start to happen this year. Um, and and I've, I've already begun to notice it. The other thing is, is that the regulatory pincher moves by the European Union, various states in the United States, and, and even the current administration, which is uh, starting to make a lot of noise about uh, regulating AI uh, and big tech. There are a number of, uh, of actions by the FTC and the DOJ against the big tech companies that are coming into focus this year. All of this, plus the fact that big equals slow, uh, means for me that these factors will conspire to, to, to make sort of for a malaise inside the big tech ecosystem. Now, I also predict, so to your point about the stock, that there is a significant uh, motivation uh, in terms of the companies themselves to continue to prop up their stock price. So I believe the stocks will continue to do okay because there are a lot of tools and a lot of levers they can pull uh, buying back their shares, uh, propping up earnings with things like adding advertising in various places, uh, cutting costs, which, of course, all big tech did last year. We will see, of course, the, the, the quarterly earnings start to lap last year's bigger numbers after they cut in the second half of 23. All of that will probably 
push the stock price to continue to go up for a while. But I think underneath it, you'll see consumers start to go, wait a minute, I'm not happy with this anymore and I want to look for alternatives. That's great for innovation. How hard is it to innovate in a world where most of our data actually goes through these big tech behemoths? For example, I have assembled all my Google apps in on my phone in like a couple of windows and I counted not at least 20 that I use in some way or form, right? From maps to, um, you know, search, of course, every day, but I have a Google Home set up that it knows when I turn off the lights somewhere, right? And when you talk about the genie, uh, I can imagine that Google will be first to the trough and some others, Apple uh, closely behind it. Amazon already has Alexa, right? So what chance is there for innovators to play or do we require uh, regulatory guidance or intervention to make that innovation possible? Well, I think this is the year we'll find the answer to that question, Stan. And it is to me the question. And it's one of the reasons that, that I titled the predictions all about the data. Um, whether or not consumers take control of their own data will, I think, depend on an innovation ecosystem, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs at larger companies uh, doing really interesting things with data. Um, entrepreneurs aren't going to in mass all of a sudden decide we want our data back and we're going to go figure out a way to do it by themselves. There has to be a market motivation for it. And sometimes regulatory, uh, you know, relief is the way it's done. We've seen this already pass into law last year in Europe uh, in the uh, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which I have written about uh, for Signal, and and I would uh, I would recommend folks get familiar with. While those pieces of legislation are not going to become law anytime soon in the United States, they do create a framework for how people might expect to interact with these big tech platforms around the world, even if they're not inside the European Union. And I expect to see some motion on those fronts this year. Okay, well, time to switch on that note to media and marketing, um, also related to big tech is like, um, the deprecation of cookies is now upon us, right? Um, and uh, I think many of the advertisers, as I read, like aren't totally ready for it yet or hasn't realized that. Um, how does that relate to big tech's dominance of advertising? Well, uh, you know, we've had, gosh, I feel like it's been five years now that we, we, we've been told that next year is the, the year the cookie dies, right? So we certainly have had a lot of time in the uh, publishing media and marketing world to get ready for this. Um, but it really is coming. As a matter of fact, I saw a story just today that Google has begun to deprecate the cookie in about 1% of Chrome users worldwide this week. Um, so it's coming. Um, are we ready? Yes, I think we are, um, but there are going to be casualties. Uh, as the media ecosystem starts to figure out a new way of delivering um, an identifying value um, without a cookie. Um, one of those ways, of course, has always been that advertisers support publications that have, you know, valid connections to uh, important audiences. That's what a publication really represents is a community of people interested in a particular topic, a topic which might be also of interest to the advertiser. That's why I'm predicting that this year we're going to see a resurgence of smaller publications that are not trying to be, you know, all things to everyone, but instead um, a very strong center of influence for an important market segment, right? That's if you think back, what the original uh, open internet was like. That's what the print world, of course, represented. Um, we did not build the tools to make it easy to, to create those kinds of publications when the internet evolved in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and then, of course, we built an audience uh, extraction machine in the big companies over the last 20 years. I think we'll start to see the internet get, as uh, Anil Dash put it, a little weird um, going forward. 
by weird, what I really mean is that smaller sites that, that have passionate communities that marketers just might find worth their time to support. That's interesting to hear. A uh, side question, I know that that's near and dear to your heart uh, because technology has roiled the world of journalism and, and, and quality publications. Um, is there hope amongst uh, journalists, uh, professionals, that uh, actually their ranks might be refilled with some quality writing? I think that the one of the core requirements of being a journalist is sort of... A, what I, what I call cynical optimism. <laughs> um, in other words, you know, we're, we're sort of required to be cynical about the world, to ask questions, to be, you know, questioning. However, we also need to be optimistic that, uh, you know, people are interested in uh, facts, truth, and the role of information in a healthy society. So I do think we are seeing a lot of interesting models emerge uh, to support journalism, they are not all commercial in nature. In other words, they're not all supported directly by either platform revenues, Facebook or Google, uh, or even Substack, um, nor are they necessarily supported by advertisers. Um, they might be supported by, uh, believe it or not, government, um, taxes, and or nonprofits. We're seeing a lot of innovation in that space, and I'll be watching it this year. So will I. So by the way, um, not necessarily all relevant for the business side of things, but uh, I don't think that you have a you have a, a full driving Tesla at this time, right? You don't, you know. Yeah, I, I wrote a piece probably about seven or eight years ago saying that the world was not ready for driverless cars. And, and uh, those who might have been paying attention in 2015 or 16, there was a lot of hype about how driverless cars were going to take over in a couple of years. That would have been 2018 or 19. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite certain that in a perfect world, driverless cars would be cruising all over the place. Uh, the problem is the world's never going to be perfect. Um, and there are questions about driverless cars that as a society, we're not really ready to grapple with, particularly the regulatory bodies responsible for determining whether or not there will be cars on the road. And those bodies tend to be cities, municipalities, counties. Um, and to ask them to make a moral decision about who's at fault when a driverless car kills someone, uh, I don't think they're going to want to make those decisions. So I don't think they're going to let them on the road in any sort of significant way in the, in the, in the you know, near term. Do you see this as an illustration of the path ahead for AI in general? Because a lot of the drive, self-driving cars are AI driven, of course, right? It's not la large language models, but it's still processing lots of data in real time on probabilistic models, right? And so I think we, we, we looked a little bit uh, through very optimistic lenses to having a uh, Jetsons future arrive tomorrow. Exactly. I think you're making a really good point. I wish I had tied those two together in my in my predictions post, Dan. Um, but it, it is a very good example of the larger issue that I call the digestion issue that we're going to have with AI. Um, that, you know, we have a lot of big uh, topics to consider, uh, to make decisions about, um, to, 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 to debate. Um, and, and generally speaking, these kinds of decisions take time. Um, and if you don't take the time to make them, if you just run ahead uh, and say, you know, tech is my true north, um, tech is always right, everything else be damned, um, generally speaking, not a good way to do things. And we saw that play out from 2012 to 2022 um, in the world of, 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 uh, of, you know, large technology advertising driven platforms. We don't want to necessarily do that again. Uh, and so I think we're going to be having some hard conversations over the next few years before we see AI truly take off uh, in a way that we can all imagine. Okay. Let me, for the last part of it, take a very practical perspective because uh, Signal360 has a lot of readers in the business community who aren't directly involved in creating the technology and so on. And in a day to day basis, might be brand managers at BNG, right? Um, what should they take away from your predictions? If you were sitting at PNG as a brand manager, what would you be watching out for and either staying away from or leaning into in the year ahead? Well, first of all, 
uh, and I know that the uh, that John Mueller, uh, PNG CEO, uh, is certainly um, kind of the paramount example of this kind of business advice. Just stay close to your customer. Pay attention to what they are doing, right? Um, if your customers are young, um, there is no question that your customers are interacting daily uh, with some kind of generative AI. Um, so you need to stay close to that and understand it. Now is the time to get very smart on those consumer behaviors and to imagine uh, how that impacts the way you go to market, the way that you produce products, the way that you, um, uh, you know, develop products. Um, but also don't get over your skis, right? Um, don't overinvest in something that doesn't necessarily have a proven return yet, or uh, that has the capacity to change dramatically in the next couple of years. And I think that's going to be a constant, which is change in, in how these products uh, are rolled out and how they work. Um, but there is always value in staying connected and close to your core customer set and to understanding and structuring uh, and really having very good hygiene efforts around your data, the current data that you have and how you capture and collect new data. And by hygiene, what I mean is not only that is it's, it's usable and structured in a way that is machine readable, but also that it can pass through any kind of compliance or regulatory test that it needs to. If you aren't ready to put your data to work upon the opportunity presenting itself, you will miss the opportunity. So focus on structuring and, 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 and good hygiene with your data. Yeah. And I, I think the, the one to add is, you know, answer my own question a little bit here, but this uh, experiment to learn, right? The best way to add, to get the questions is you know, first uh, understand the questions to ask and then go find and learn some answers, right? And the best way to do it is by just small experiments that gets you into what it, oh, this is what it really does. So, okay. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of nuts to not have a budget. Uh, it can be a small percentage, but have a budget for experimentation and for learning. That's very different than going all in on a big, you know, project uh, because you want to be able to say, it, you know, uh, in a press release or a board meeting that you have an AI strategy. Um, but learning and experimenting is really crucial. Okay, John, uh, before we go, thank you very much for all the insights. But I did notice that you stopped at nine this year, nine predictions. Your, your habit is 10. Um, what if you give the viewers in, uh, of this uh, your 10th one? What might be the wild card? For all I care, it might be who wins the Super Bowl, uh, which we'll take to Las Vegas, I guess. Um, but what what would it be? I think it will be a very uneventful election year. I didn't want to put that in the official uh, predictions because I've found that writing about politics is no no one's interested in that, uh, at least from from my point of view. But I think there's so much at stake that a lot of people are paying attention. And I think we're going to have an okay year that way, even though everyone's freaking out about it. Okay. Well, that will be an interesting starting point for January 5th or so next year. Um, and I, I invite everybody back to uh, what the predictions might be and we can look forward. But in the meantime, we have a year ahead and John and I and the Signal360 team are hard at work to lay out uh, a whole content uh, editorial plan that will address as many of the points that John just brought up and many others. We will appreciate your input as always. And John, uh, you and I will see each other back often and not in the least because Signal 24 is planned for July 17th. Everybody mark that, Wednesday, July 17th. And uh, if I am not mistaken, this afternoon we have a first planning meeting uh, to set the, the theme and so on. So more news to come. I want to thank everybody who joined us. Um, please feel free to reach out to John, myself, or others on the team. Uh, and John, I'm looking forward to a very interesting year ahead. And let's take stock in your predictions next year when we get back. I look forward to it. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.